Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Okay. Let me explain you something. This talk will be uh, really depressing and will be really sad and it will be about uh, a lot of my personal traumas <laughs> and a couple of reasons why I drink alcohol almost every day. <laughs> so I need to feel your energy before we start, okay? Because we are at Code Dive, not zombie conference, zombie programmers, you can give me more code. But we are at Code Dive, so we'll, we'll try to do it once again. Good morning. Good morning. Much better, okay. Uh, yeah. The title of the talk is Patterns of Organic Architecture, and the subtitle is Madman's Diary. So those people in the first row, be careful, I can bite, I can spill, I can be pretty aggressive, so don't get offended if I start to kick you. Uh, at the end of the talk, I will try to bring some hope, so at least a little bit of hope. Okay. First thing, before we close the doors, this is a rule at every my presentation, we close the door at some point of time, okay? Thank you. So people don't leave. <coughs> this is the <laughs> I need to be sure that you listen till the end. So uh, this is not my intention. This was after one of the conference, somebody told me that he felt offended after my talk. So this is not my intention to make you feel offended. This is my view of the world, my experience, my twisted uh, sense of humor. It's about mostly me, because as my wife says, my ego is bigger than my car. So please respect, OK, uh, my experiences, 15 years. And remember, you can always leave the room. That's not true. Now you can't. Thank you. Uh, you can always talk to me. Uh, and despite things people say, I'm a pretty nice person, especially when I'm drunk. OK, about me. Uh, my name is Jaroslav Pauka. I'm a chief architect in Lumes. Yeah, I work in Krakow. I'm the owner at Cementis, my small uh, one-person company doing coaching and cons consulting <laughs> because I love to learn people, teach people, yeah, teach people is better because I basically like when people listen to me. <laughs> I tweet, uh, I usually don't blog because there is enough blogs in the world, so people don't need more. So I code. So you can find my, I'm uh, uh, probably the last living coding architect in Krakow. I hope so. Uh, uh, so I code different uh, things, mostly in Java, <coughs> because I'm with Java since 99, so quite a long time. <sighs> yeah. What does society think I do when I say I'm the chief architect? Yeah. And this is the story about my mom. Uh, and she is the source of all my mental problems. Sorry, uh, the code is problem. <laughs> <laughs> so what does society think I do when I say I'm the chief architect? They think this, okay? They think I'm building houses. So this is the question I get usually at every Christmas Eve from my uh, mom. You know, can we sh actually see some of your buildings? No? Uh, and also ladies in the bank, because I'm uh, struggling with, uh, to get some credit at the moment. Oh, you're chief architect. Can we see something in Krakow? No. <laughs> so this is what society thinks about the architects. The uh, first and most important uh, person in my life, my wife, thinks I'm doing this kind of stuff at work. <laughs> OK? It's almost true, <laughs> with small, small, small difference. This lady, okay? It's usually one of my friends. <laughs> because I have only men in the, unfortunately, men in, the, in, in my team. So imagine, uh, who can be? Maybe my performance engineer, Damian. Yeah. <laughs> it's the moment, you know, I told you it won't work. <clears throat> so this is what my wife thinks. I try to explain, no, no, we don't have women at work. You can feel safe. This is uh, what I actually do. Do you have an idea what I do? You drink. Excuse uh, me? Drink. I drink. Okay. <laughs> I do this. 
yeah, archaeology. This is why this uh, talk is quite depressing and sad, because when I started and I joined industry uh, this 15 years ago, I think I will build skyscrapers with code. Yeah? Do you have the same feeling the first day after university and we'll build something big? 15 years later, and nothing big was created. <laughs> so what I mostly do is work with legacy code. It's a, some kind of bad karma. I had, I had to do something, did something bad in my past life. You know? <laughs> really? I don't know. Maybe I was a vi Viking or, you know, riding the, the north part of Europe, doing nasty things to villagers. No, I don't know, something bad. Because whenever I come to the new organization, after the interview, they, but they, when they promise uh, that they have the latest and greatest technology stuck in the world, I come, I open the uh, source repository, and I said, oh my god, again. <laughs> 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 and so one of my bosses, uh, two years ago, three years ago actually, when I was leaving my past uh, work, he said, you know what you, why you get this legacy code all the time? Because you have this madman look in the eyes. <laughs> and I started to love it. And I did, because I'm close to my 40s, really close. This is the last turn, when there is, the, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I did some kind of retrospection of my life, and I counted, actually. I was in eight companies in 16 years. Okay? Not actually all the time new companies, because uh, for quite a long period of time, these were the same people, same projects, but just name changes. <laughs> But I counted as a different company, okay? To just impress you. <laughs> and then what I did, I counted the amount of projects by simply trying to remember, to recall all the names of Java packages I was working with. Yeah? So it was really long night, long, lots of cherry vodka, and I counted 26 projects I work with, okay? And just one of his projects was built from scratch. Just once in my lifetime, miserable life. <laughs> I had a situation when somebody gave me empty SVN repository. Do you feel the joy in my eyes? <laughs> Nothing. Not even single build XML or POM XML. No, we screwed up. So how do I feel about it after the 16 years? Because I tried to, in the beginning, fight with it. You know, I tried to work with startups, but they always, they were always able to find some legacy for me. <laughs> so at the, some point of time, I decided, okay, don't fight it, accept it, build on it, yeah, use it as your strength, as your weapon, the legacy systems. So this is how I feel every day. <laughs> this is actually me coming out from the elevator. This is what I call the aches of ultimate code. Yeah? This is where I remove code from the repositories. I feel pretty good about it. Oh, yeah, one more thing. So, let's do like this. You're my psychologist. Okay? Imagine there is a not existing couch behind me. I'm laying on this couch. You are all my psychologists. You need to feel, send me good energy. And I will tell you the story, okay? <laughs> and you know, we'll make this meeting successful if I will feel better, not you, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so uh, to make sure, I want to tell you what kind of patterns, test-driven development, domain-driven development, behavior development, de 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 driven development, acceptance-driven development, fuck-driven development technology. <laughs> Mixed with Scala, Haskell, BrainFuck, Whitespace, uh, Python, Perl, plus Spring, J2E, functional aspect oriented will help you. Okay? One thing I can tell you for sure after 15 years stop searching for a silver bullet. Okay? Stop. And stop searching for some secret ingredient, you know, to the mixture, like Harry Potter 
but will save your life forever. No, accept it, okay? So, but something, I will tell you something. I will tell you how to live with monolithic legacy code base, which gets closer and closer with edge line to border of human capabilities and is about to collapse into black hole, which is going to suck all living developers within its reach. If you, if, you, if you come to work, open your favorite IDE, you know, IntelliJ, Eclipse, uh, NetBeans, VI, Emacs. If you, if you picture this in your repository, this talk is for you. <laughs> Let me draw some analogy. Do you see this fence? This is security layer. <laughs> okay. This one, this is the, the, uh, the transformers from value objects to entities, okay? Here are a couple of broker windows, so somebody did something nasty to framework. And, you know, with bushes, this is the UI. So, <laughs> this is my code every day. And I like it. Because uh, we are living in a big ball of, big ball of math. Do you know this paper? from, I would say, 80s, the big ball of mud architecture, recommended. Uh, it was my actually first job, and one of the be best CTOs I worked with, he told me when I ca came to work, you know, this is the, uh, he gave me two things. This article, big, mo big ball of mud, and uh, death march project by, uh, by Edward Yurdon. And he said, you know, if you read it and come back to work, you'll be senior. I read it, and I became a senior developer. <coughs> because, why? Do you know this? It is not actually mine. This is from one of the uh, architecture anti-patterns books. Uh, these are the architecture anti-patterns. Collected, described. Do you know some of these? This is the one I love. The Grand Old Duke of York. So this is basically the architecture driven by myself. Usually you have one single person in the whole organization. We had, uh, yeah, we had one person with 1,500 developers, and there was one Iber principal enterprise uh, senior uh, fellow engineer architect, the Grand Duke of York. And every time we were about to make any decision in the project, we had to ask him for permission. No, recognize this pattern? And he wrote his last line of code in the mid of 70s in COBOL and Rex. <laughs> and he, we, were, we were asking him, you, actually, what do you think about Hibernate and Spring? Oh, I, I haven't heard it. Do we have implementation in COBOL? <laughs> so this is one of the model of anti archi, uh, architecture anti-patterns. The second one I meet very often in large organization is design by committee. Do you know it? You have around 15 developers and 50 architects. Okay? The inverse pyramid. And everybody has to agree. So actually the decision is never made because they are so good. They are so sure about their capabilities, but they by definition don't agree with everything. This is quite a good pattern, because what I did in one of the organizations, I said, guys, you know, actually, we need your approval for this big, big, big project. And they started to think in February. And the next day, we started development without saying to anybody that we are doing, actually, the development. And when they, when they came back after vacation in uh, October, I believe, with the final decision, we said, actually, we have a prototype running, and it's production ready. Uh, guys, do you approve? This, <coughs> yeah, this is lovely. Warm bodies, corporations. Do you know this architecture pattern? We hire people because we have a budget. Maybe someday they will be necessary. <laughs> but because you put these people in the organization, they write code. More code, more unnecessary code. Okay, I won't go through this list because it's boring. 
Uh, you can read it. It's called anti uh, Architecture Anti-Patterns, and I think it's free uh, ebook. Couple of interesting things: how to deal with kind such kind of architectures in organizations. But there is one thing which connects all of these cases. I discovered. Well, first, I saw the mice, mouse. Uh, then I saw the, the answer. What is the ultimate problem of every software system? One. Complexity. Okay. Do you agree? Okay. Why do you agree? Because somebody told you? <laughs> it depends. If you start answering questions, it depends. You are on a straight way to become consultant. <laughs> Complexity. But you know, everybody tells uh, tell us uh, at the university. Is uh, fortunately, I haven't finished the technical university. I finished chemistry, so nobody was telling me about the complexity. I had to discover it myself. But everybody tells you complexity is wrong. Why? It depends. <laughs> okay, I, I was thinking for 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 over a year, trying. Okay, why the, there is a problem with complexity? Maybe there is another problem, and just some, you know, trendy trendsetters from the conferences like. <laughs> Okay, uh, I try tr to convince you that complexity is a problem. So I think that I have an answer. First of all, I love science. Who doesn't love science? Okay, thank you. Because if you don't life, like science, love science, you can leave the room, but we won't open the door. So, <laughs> <coughs> so I try to dig deeper. And I found out that actually people outside of our industry are talking about complexity since the 18th century. We are not special. We are not unique. Our problems are not unique. This everything is solved, but you are reading the wrong books. <laughs> so I started to dig problems of system thinking. System, I won't tell you. It's just you know planting seeds. You you leave the room and start to look for, look for it. The system dynamics complexity theory is actually the uh, 50s of uh, of the past century. System dynamics is uh, also the system thinking is the 18th century, and strange strange attractor is the 70s. Uh, these are concepts trying to explain why life is hard, and they came to the same conclusion: the complexity. <coughs> Can anybody see this drawing? Okay, somebody asked me to, look, to move right. Okay, I like to move. <sighs> so, this is based on the uh, theory of system dynamics, where you can actually model everything. Everything you can model using the, the system dynamics approach. So, I, so, what I did in the winter sun, snowy evening, I modeled Scrum using system dynamics, okay? The simple possible model of Scrum. We have a backlog, so this is our input to the system, okay? We have some team velocity, and we produce features. Simple. The thing is that while we are producing features, we increase complexity of the system. Is it true? Yeah. Yes. We add accidental and we add essential complexity. Yeah? One is good, the other one is bad. The thing is, because we add complexity, do we develop our systems faster or slower? Slower. Yes? Support me because I can get angry. Slower. So what happens? The dev team's velocity gets down, not up. It doesn't stabilize, it gets down. So I fit, uh, there is a nice uh, tool, actually this is drawing for the school, it's called Insight Maker, used to uh, modeling the systems. And he drew me something like this, after I proposed this model to the system. The blue line is the number of features actually implemented in the system, and the green is the size of the backlog. Imagine ideal environment. We have one team, we don't add people, they code, they don't play football, blah, blah, blah. And they don't go to meetings. At some point of time, what you see on this, you will stop adding features. 
it will happen, and it happens. You just don't notice. It just happens. What happens at the moment when we slow down, yeah, and the, the first department which realizes that we slow down is marketing, where are my features? <laughs> is the gap. Yeah? This is the gap between what we need and what we actually can deliver. This, this creates, this is the part of system thinking theory, a tension. Tension between you and the rest of the world. You poor developers, we invest in you, we send, we send you to conferences, we give you football, cola, pizza. In, in any industry, do they give pizza at work? Yes. So they you know, treat us like you know, princesses and princes, and we, we don't deliver. <laughs> so this is the moment when organization at some level invisible for you, you know, at the 11th floor, you are in the basement, yeah, they are in the 11th floor, they see all oh, things get slower. Let's do something about it, okay? So you, what usually organizations do? Sorry. <laughs> there was a place for a joke. Yes. It is called the Krakow Software Development Model. <laughs> the thing is that I was giving the, the stock in a couple of cities in... in uh, in Poland, and in every city say, they were saying, no, it's actually Warsaw development model, yeah? <laughs> so let's hire more students. This is what usually organizations do. I don't want to offend students. It's just a synonym of people who just are on the beginning of their path, okay? Usually we hire the most, uh, uh, the students who uh, are, you know, seventh year or eighth year studying, because are, they are the most desperate to do anything. So this is the one pattern. We're adding more students. It's not against students, it's about the organizations. You are not wrong, organizations are wrong. Yes! Let's rewrite it from scratch. And because we are writing, of course, the new SQL technology we should know shit about. Okay? We don't know nothing about the technology, but yet you rewrite the system. How fucking scientific. <laughs> Where we end up? <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually the picture from Indonesia. Indonesia, yeah. And this is the moment where uh, probably they had more than one architect in the system. <laughs> they never talked to each other, but they very really wanted to create the integration between this layer. So the you know, crafty developers came up with the anti-corruption layer here, yeah? And everything works perfectly. Told you it will be depressing. <laughs> okay, why? What are the reasons, yeah? How many rewrite projects we need to screw to learn something? Endless number of rewrite projects. You know, this project, uh, we are created with the names, offload projects, next generation something, rewrite the results. Time is not our, on our side. You know, we have really big ego, bigger than mine. Somebody was writing this system for 20 years, and we sent estimates that we will do it in two. Really? <laughs> Seriously? I was in, uh, working at uh, uh, one project when uh, the system was developed in uh, IBM TPF, Transaction Processing Facility. Uh, the project was actually in development, active development, of course, the production next releases for 20 years. And when somebody came and said, OK, we need to be cost effective and get, uh, get out from, from the mainframe world and let's move to Java, Somebody sent the, the two teams actually sent estimates. We will do it in three years. Are we some kind of Superman? The mixture of Superman, Batman, and somebody else? Really? This is one of the problems. These systems were created for a long time. This is one of the reasons why this project failed. We are always too optimistic in, in the estimates. The second reason, yes. So, you know, actually, you are my project owner, yeah? 
and you say, actually, we are renting this, this system, we are investing a lot of money, we are building new teams, selecting technology, let's add a couple of extra features. We, were, we wa always wanted to have these features in our system. This is a good moment to add these features to the system. Usually, these extra features break the whole system. Because the only thing we deliver, we deliver the extra features without the remaining part of the system we are rewriting, yes? Because the extra features are the things which will sell the system to the management, yeah? To, for the approval. The next reason, yeah, our favorite technology. Scala, yeah, yeah, it will solve all, the pro all, all our problems. Yeah, 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 we'll do it in Akka. Whoa! We don't have a problem with the uh, concurrency in this project, but actually, why not? Technology won't solve anything. It won't solve any problem. Yes, this is good reason. Very often, this all kinds of rewrite projects are seen as purely technical projects. Yeah. So, from the management point of view, you transform the one source code to the another source code. Yeah. It is still the source code. It's like rewriting document from Word to Excel. It shouldn't be a problem. So you don't need business experts in the projects. This is what I saw. In majority of cases, we didn't have in this kind of projects business analysts, subject matter experts, whatever call you call these people, because they are all ne not necessary, because everything is in the code. No. I've been in a project when uh, a lady was not in the code. There was a lady in HR who knew that at last Friday of every month, she needs to get into the system, tick some secret box, checkbox, and this is the only way reports will get generated. Because there was a bug, nobody fixed it. She knew it, but she just needs to come into the system every last Friday of the month, do the change, and everything will be fine. It was not coded into the system. And the last uh, reason is us, ignorance and arrogance. Yeah? So, because all of these approaches, big bang approaches, uh, iterative approaches, and blah, blah, blah approaches, doesn't work, maybe we'll try to do something different. There is now the hope part, okay? <coughs> The gap. I will tell you about things. <sighs> I don't think I shouldn't call them mine because it's so simple, but it's even a shame to say that these things are mine. But things I was using over years, and uh, I'm getting better at these things. Uh, and these things, a couple of tricks really helped me with, with the legacy, legacy code. First of all, we need to change our thinking, okay? What is architecture? My favorite <laughs> question on the conferences. Guys, come on, you can win some prizes. What is architecture? What is software architecture? Sweeney? Uh, you were on this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> what is software architecture? Okay. This is the problem, the way we are thinking about software architecture. We think the way people think about buildings, yeah? But you, once you set it up, it must exist and it won't change. And this is something written in stone. Actually, it's not. Let's try to do some brain experiment and start think for a moment about the architecture as a process, okay? But the architecture is a process which is going to move you from this design of the system to this design of the system, okay? So this is process. It changes the way people think about it. Because if it's a process, it takes time. So nobody will come to you and say, you know, can you change architecture? Yeah, 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 for tomorrow. Because yeah, well, you, just, uh, you write the UML diagrams and yeah, we have new architecture. Yeah? Actually, it is a process, OK? So this is uh, my definition of architecture. It isn't right. I don't agree with it. But what is what it is. So for me, architecture is a process which is goal is to transfer your system from one design to another design. Process and transform. 
two most important parts for me in the architecture. But we are going to change something, not the UML diagrams, but actually change something, and it will take time, okay? <coughs> so this is the process I'm going, I'm using when I'm approaching legacy systems. The first thing, I need to understand the gap. Why I need to write the system? What is the reason? Better scalability, better performance. There must be a reason to do it. If the system works and makes money, forget about it. It makes money. Leave it as it is. Wrap it in an ISOA, JSON, REST, uh, interfaces, microservices, but leave this. If you don't need, if you don't have a change. The next thing is you need to understand the context, the context on or, uh, of the organization in which you are changing the system. Okay? The context means, do I have, have enough Scala freaks in the company to move into Scala? Okay? Because I was working recently with some nice startup. They were doing in Scala and actually uh, they had 20 developers in PHP and one Scala guru. Actually, the guy was pretty good, but you don't select technology based on somebody else's preferences. And then you need to identify constraints, the money, the time. Do you know Tom DeMarco? He said recently that he is really sorry for these words <laughs> because he wrote this book in the 60s, I believe. You can control what you can measure. You actually said something different. But after all these years in IT, you get what you measure. <laughs> and actually, I say, because I will never write a book, I don't have time, you can reason about what you can measure. So the first step here to understand the cap, understand the context, and identify a constraint is to measure your system, your architecture. <coughs> so what are the measures of architecture? Okay. <coughs> this is the line you're moving your system between the complexity and resilience. You can't have system which is resilient and at the same time is really complex, okay? No. Unless you are drunk. So how to measure the architecture? I think that uh, the source code proof will tell you and listen to the system, you must. After 15 years and after all these bottles of alcohol, when I'm alone in the office, usually at eight in the morning, I hear system whispering to me. You know, there is some nice whispers from Git repository. Yarek, Yarek, help. Don't you hear it? Really? <laughs> it whispers to me in many ways. There will be some code because this is code dive. The thing is that we have tons of data in our system at our disposal, but we don't use it. We just learn new framework. Yeah? <laughs> the source control, the bug tracker, the continuous integration, static code analysis has all the data you need to understand how to re start rewrite your system. And you don't need expensive tools, you just need Bash and a little bit of Python with love. Okay, example, let's find stable parts of the system. What I mean stable, the parts of the system which doesn't change often. I'm not say, f thinking about the production, I'm thinking about the stability in a context of how often the code changes. Uh, yeah, I am the enterprise bash developer. <laughs> I started, really started to love it. So this is what you actually get, you, uh, you can get using Bash and uh, the little uh, Jacoco uh, coverage tool. So what I'm get actually getting in this, uh, <coughs> with this small script is the complexity versus the amount of changes in a file. Okay? Two, dimen two dimensions. And I use GNU plot because Excel doesn't work on my terminal. And I get this, okay? So here we have the rate of change 
how often the file was changed in the history, and what is his current complexity. The dots are actually a files in the real project. This is from rather small project to just to, to, to prove you something. Have you heard about it, Michael Feathers Quadrant? So what he did, he did exactly and split it, uh, and split it uh, this into four areas, four quadrants. So tools, not so complex, uh, probably created in the first days of a project. Pfft, don't touch it. Works, yeah. Ugly stables. So they are probably created at the same time the tools were created, but but some junior programmers. Don't touch it. They are stable, you know. Complex, but you won't probably look into this direction. Breeding grounds is where the development started. So we didn't manage to add complexity yet, but we are changing the things like hell, okay? But not complex yet. So this is development, don't touch this part of the system. This is the design flow, high complexity, the high rate. Easy, with a couple of scripts, you just, just get the information, okay, where to start, where to cut the boundaries of the system, which part of the system to remove, which part of the system to improve? This one. Don't care, don't care, don't care. This one. Because this is the problem when you start the refactoring efforts. Yeah, somebody gave you budget and do refactoring. Where to start? Five million files. So this is simple thing. Start here, because here it will give you the most benefit. OK, next example. How much information you have in your system. I will move to this side. <laughs> Let's find fragile parts of the system. Who knows what are the fragile parts of the system? They are called minefields. Yeah? You change here, it explodes there. <laughs> so how to find it? Another Python, no, this time Python. I'm not so good at Bash. So I said, OK, let's go to our continuous integration and look which parts of the system fail the build most often, yeah? So let's see how often when I commit file X, yeah, pomixml, for example, or hello world.java, how often the system fails to build, fail to pass the test. This script, Jenkins API, a little bit of from uh, Python, and I've got the information. But every time I was committing this and this together, three times, build fail. When I committed this file and this file together, this test fail. So this is the kind of information you won't get from static code analysis. Because there are limits of static code analysis, I will tell you later. No? You see that there is some hidden dependency between these two tests, yeah? Which causes them probably the order in which they are launched, causes them to fail. You need to be careful with this, this kind of data. You need to really read it. Because there is a lot of false positives, you need to say, OK, it doesn't look good, why? Okay? Don't trust it all the time. The last example, and then I will move to the actual uh, content of the talk, <laughs> because it is still introduction, <coughs> is are my classes packaged together? Do you know the package principle from Solid, from Uncle Bob? What changes cook together should be packaged together? Thank you. So how to answer this question? Simply, I did this. Again, uh, Mercurial. I don't know, Git is fine, but Mercurial is also good. And I just uh, I reported off change, uh, all changes in the repository in the XML format. And then I feed in this data to Neo4j graph database to see how often the files change together. Okay, to just count it, to draw the graph and count it. Actually, uh, when I was presenting this talk, I was using Neo4j, and now I learned that there is something called JQA Assistant, which is a tool which can do it for you. You don't have to write it. It does the analysis of the of your code using Neo4j uh, graph database. So what I aha uh -huh, lady. So what I have here, I have here that, for example, my summary scenario listener 
have changed 13 times with logging scenario listener, and actually they are in the same package. Okay, that's good. The logging scenario listener, okay, so this is the wrong query. The POM XML, don't care, but for example, with bench test and run test, they change together 12 times. Okay, they are in the right package. Simple things you can do. Okay, let's start the official <laughs> part. So can you please me show these uh, patterns of organic architecture? Once you identify using this simple, this is not the end of the story, you can do brilliant things like semantic versioning. For example, parse your uh, files when you, push your, uh, you, when you push these things to, to STM. Have you heard about semantic versioning? But you have versioning at the level of methods. So you can compare how often methods changed and you can do it, there are tools for you. Once you get into the system, ask all these questions, gather the data, you need to start refactoring, yeah? rewrite, offload projects. Actually, there are three examples, three, three patterns I'm using. The first pattern, usually I start, is uh, I call it sow and grow. I should become a writer, poetry writer. Sow and grow. It is known as refactoring, so because everybody knows refactoring, I won't explain you because it's boring, but I will tell you about some things wrong we are doing about refactoring. The one evil thing is compulsive refactoring. Do you know it? I am the compulsive refactoring master. Jarek, can you implement this? Yeah, 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 yeah. Open the file. Man, what a piece of shit. Let's rewrite it. Then comes this moment when I scroll up and I see author of this file, and it's me. <laughs> and I said, oh, pretty good. <laughs> so, you know, how often you, you, you are about to implement something, the user story, and you see that the code is bad, and you in, in, inside, I can stand it, I have to improve it. No! First check if it's worth it, if it will give you benefit. Check how often this file is used. What kind of role this file plays in the system? Don't do compulsive refactoring. Do it in small chunks and control way, plant. Ask the system which parts of the system need some love, not the whole part of the system. <laughs> yeah, this is. Do we have some uh, Scrum Masters? This is guys for you. Yes? Please, for God's sake, no user stories in Jira refactor. Really? Do I need user story to make something better? Did your mom, when you're a kid, were you going to, to your mom and asking, Mom, can I clean the room? <laughs> this is the same thing. Going to somebody asking if I can make something better is like asking mom if I can clean the room. People, we are engineers. We are the owners of this world. Have you thought about it? Everything runs on software. There is a pleasure in the software written. There is a banking, your finance. There is, you can do shopping, you can do social, you can do everything in software. We are owners of this world. So please behave like engineers and don't ask for permission. At least from time to time, ask for forgiveness. <laughs> the, another example is when you go with your car to change the tire, and the guy who is doing this has spotted a leak in the brake you know, oil. Do you expect him to fix it or to call you for permission? It is about your safety. He is engineer, you are engineers, and you fix these things. But think before you start. Don't do it compulsively. And give technical depth a meaning. But we will talk about it. What is also important is visualize the things we are doing. Tak? Show these graphs, use sonar, uh, whatever kind of uh, visualization technique to show that you are actually improving something. Yeah? Show more green on the wall. No red test, green test. And select a small amount of metrics you will track. Okay? Don't track everything. Don't look at the MacCape complexity, response for classes, uh, LOC, and other metrics. It's too much. Select these metrics which support your goal. Okay? Make a goal clear to everybody. You want to improve X, stability, performance, maintainability, time to market. 
and measure just this simple thing because you get what you measure. Okay? Then you can change this measure later on and say, okay, now I'm going to change and improve something else. And these are the metrics I'm going to, to track. Don't do it at all, once at all. Once you are finished with refactoring, there is next thing you can do, and this is the, my lovely topic, sow and harvest. I'm feeling like you know, the farmer. When I sow the code, and it's called modularization. From time to time, you need to cut stable parts of, out of the system, okay? You need to work with smaller code. You need to be able to compile and test in 30 seconds, not 20 minutes. Do I have somebody from my organization? No, 30 minutes. Uh, <coughs> it has to be fast, so you need to modularize. But what is really important, and the mistake I did a lot of time, is you need to modularize to the stable parts of the system. So you go to the source code, you say, okay, this hasn't changed for 10 years, there were no new business requirements, this is pretty stable, I can extract it, okay? I can move it somewhere else, to microservices, ACCA, whatever. And make dependencies to the stable parts of the system, okay? Because if you make dependencies to unstable parts of the system, the whole system will be unstable. Simple. But first, <laughs> framework, yeah? I was hating about framework for 30 minutes and I'm talking about framework. How inconsistent am I? <coughs> I'm not joking. Uh, this is actually a small experiment I did some time ago and learned just recently that somebody else did the same thing. But you can build a mental framework for your biologic protein CPU, okay? It needs to build on really clearly defined goals. You need to adjust strategy to your capabilities. If your team is full of juniors, don't force them, okay? They need to learn, it takes time, okay? Give yourself some design space. Make the hardest decision at the end of the project. Create abstractions in the project to make sure that you will be free to change because your goal is moving target. If your sales goals, if your organization goals are moving, you need to be able to move as well. What I'm thinking about saying framework. How many times do you have 400 pages architectures in the system? Just uh, one introduction, two pages of introduction with the names of all editors and then 400 of UMLs. Every type of UML diagram, every. Does it give any value to you? To me, to me not. So if we can simplify and say, what if our architecture would look like this? This is the whole description of architecture in one of our projects, okay? Don't copy it. This is not the ultimate solution. This is just an example. Don't to go to your boss and say, somebody said in conferences we should use it. No, it's just an example. Don't call me. We said simple, but we separate the batch processing from the online. All modules will communicate asynchronously. The users will see the system as a one, so, so common user interface. Uh, the only thing we will share is a model. So no shared databases, no shared storage, no shared anything, just the model of the application. And the system will compile and uh, do its stuff in uh, above 60 seconds. Is it clear enough for your architecture? See how many space you have here. No word about technology. You are free to change. Actually, there is a company called DIG. When they have this kind of definition, they call it napkin architecture. Okay? So the rule is that you need to write the rules, principles of your architecture to squeeze it uh, in the napkin. And make it simple, because it gives you a room. <coughs> the one important thing is that every module within the system needs to share this common approach. Okay? That's all. Uh, moving? Moving. Yes! Um, so we did the refactoring, and it was pretty good. Then we did 
modularization when extracted to parts of the system. Uh, the system is, is better, stable, it compiles, and it's better, and it's lovely. But despite our best effort, all the conferences we were, and all the trainings, and knowledge, and uh, after <laughs> hours, yeah, <coughs> not after parties, after hours, working hard, there is one thing that happens to every system. Okay? The complexity finds the biggest uh, racket <laughs> in the neighborhood, jumps onto the racket, and sky is the limit. This is what uh, one of the uh, senior VPs uh, told me once. Uh, I was asking if I can do this project, and she said, yes, Jarek, the sky is the limit, and there is no sky. So <laughs> complexity goes up. Whatever you do, it will. Complexity is the new entropy, okay? End of story. It will grow, it won't shrink. Let's remove. How you can tackle complexity? By removing. You know, at the university, I mean, this is, I think, the fault of universities and, and many book authors, they teach you how to add code. Who teaches you how to remove code? Our brain has its own limitations. Even the universe has its limitations. Nobody teaches you how to remove code. And this is the only way where you can make drastic changes in the complexity of your application. You need to <coughs> answer yourself a couple of questions. Do you know how users use your application? Because I know the story. OK. OK, I can. Uh, we were working on some feature, and there was one test failing, and we spent like two weeks to, to integration test, to improve, to, to fix this integration test. We fixed it, and at the end of the day, somebody came back from vacation. We said, Jose, because <coughs> we had a guy in team, we fixed it. Why? Siemens is no longer our customer. <laughs> Do you know the surprise? Two weeks. How many pieces of the code you have in your system, which are not used. Do you know about it? I did once. As I, that's why you sent me to the legacy systems. I shipped to production code which was instrumented with Cobertura. Nobody notices it. I just you know, say, oh, sorry, it's slower, it's a bug. <laughs> but it was running actually in the production for a week. So I get the code coverage from production, and I came back with his numbers and said, oh my god, 80% of the system is not used. So why we have it in the repository? Just remove it. It is waste of your disk space, it is waste of your brain power, because you need to open these large files and you need to analyze it. It is waste of CPU, remove it. Yeah, best case, do you know what your biggest customer is no longer using your system? Yeah, killer feature. <laughs> uh, you're like, we need a system, and he will need to accept 40 million transactions per hour. And then it was 2002. So we did, so we didn't have ACA, and we didn't have, you know, this concurrency, nice things in Java. So we did really brilliant magic, some JNI stuff in Java, and, you know, stretching our brain to the limits. <laughs> Boom. Release, month later, first report from the production, 40 customers. <laughs> really, if you release the feature and the intelligent, wise organization do this, they monitor how the new features are used. If they are not used and there is no return from investment, don't keep it, kill it. Other ways, how to understand how your system is used? Really, you know, it's enough. In some cases, it's enough. In some kinds of application, Apache Logs is enough source of knowledge to see that these two REST services created in the dark days of uh, 2005 are never actually called. Remove it. 
And if they are actually necessary once a year by some mystic customer, we will just at least say sorry. It doesn't, you know, it's not costly. Sorry, we didn't know. Instrument your code. Add aspects, yeah? Use things like Byteman. Byteman can be, uh, this is a tool from JWAS, which can be uh, <coughs> bind, bound to the running virtual, virtual machine, instrument the code, gather statistic, you can then switch it off, the code will run, uh, it will be reverted, but you can have <coughs> your data. Backtracker, go to Jira, and if you have a quite nice setup of, of Backtracker, find a feature for which there was no single bug reported over half a year. Because we don't write perfect software, okay? Let's make an agreement. We don't write it and we won't do it. So if there is a feature which, does, which doesn't have bug reported, there are two possibilities. Nobody using it, or customer found some nice workarounds. <laughs> do the analysis, yeah? You have your data. And the last source of the information priceless, and we don't respect these people enough, because they are people. People from support. They know the truth about your system. Not testers, not product owners. Press testers, now the you know, system is big, but we are testing only the uh, optimistic part. Yeah? So we don't know what happens when we enter the wrong number. The product owners, yeah, they deliver the feature, get the bonus, move to the next feature. So they do not understand the whole system. The only part of your organization which understands the whole system and is indirect, without any layers, contact with customers, is support. They told me things about my, um, the system I'm working, I, I, I didn't know, but we can do actually such things in our system. They told me, for example, that our system is used, this is the HR system for recruiting, but our system is actually used like Dropbox as a fire share, because what recruiters do when they come to work, they open, they have bookmarked this page, new applicants. They come and they, they don't go to reports, they don't log in, they go like directly to see the list of people they are going to call this uh, today. And to this list, we have attached CVs and uh, motivation letters. So our system spends 60% of its, almost 60% of its, of its power serving files. <laughs> We are not something great. We are just enterprise Dropbox for HR people. And this is what I heard from people from support. I'm going to, to the end. So yeah, be nice. Take them for a beer. Don't talk about frameworks. They don't care about it. And they can tell you the truth about your system. Don't buy intensive extensive tools. I was uh, trapped some time ago. I bought, bought something to do the analysis and it didn't tell me anything. You know how your system is constructed. You know what kind of technologies and uh, mystical programming languages you have in your, in your system and how it's layout. Use power of Bash and Python and it's enough. And it's cool. Actually, it's cool. It's better for your brain. And one last thing. Please. Can I? Uh, please. Don't comment out code. Please. Use SCM, okay? Because it hurts my brain. No, do you, you have it like, you open the file, you are ready for an adventure. <laughs> New file in the system. The adventure is coming. The Tenazosaurus Rex is coming from the screen. You open up green. The wall of uh, Eclipse has a green comment, okay? Uh, IntelliJ has red comments or blue? <laughs> gray. Oh, it is much better, but green is pretty. So you see this wall of gray text, and you scroll, scroll, waiting for something here to come out. Oh, final G, retro zero. Mm. <laughs> Source control will tell you the truth, OK? And it will remember. What's next? If you apply all these things, I don't promise anything, OK? Just try. Because what will give you, if you apply these three approaches, you do refactoring as long as you can. When it's, you reach the limit, you try to modularize. When you reach, reach the next limit, you try to just simply remove parts of the code. You would reach to this. This is the part of system thinking. 
But hierarchical systems lead to self-organizing systems, which lead to resilient systems. A little bit of philosophy at the end. Yeah. This is not mine, but I think it's really important for you to remember what you are engineers. And the system resilience is often sacrificed for purpose of short-term productivity and stability. Do you know it? Oh, we need to get it on production, but it will break system. No, you need to... Productivity and stability are usual excuses for turning creative human beings into mechanical adjuncts to production process. Do you feel like this? Just deliver the, the code. Don't think. I've heard this once. Just write it. Don't think. <laughs> the, the other story I heard from, Tom, from one CTO, uh, and I can tell you after all, all because it's all recorded, he said, you know, Jarek, I don't need testers. I need developers who don't write bugs. <laughs> So this is the kind of uh, approach the current management uh, style uh, uses on, on us poor engineers. You know why? Because they are afraid of us. We have the power. I was manager for five years because I said, OK, there must be life on the other side of the fence, an intelligent life. <laughs> and I went there. And actually, there is intelligent life, but and they are really intelligent people. The problem is that they are powerless. The frustration of managers, for in my personal opinion, comes from the lack of impact. What you can do? Stand on somebody and code faster. <laughs> this is what, why, why I came back, because it gave me power back. I can actually deliver something, and I ha I'm in control. Guys, you are. Oh, yeah. So, uh, read this book. Don't read the next uh, programming book. Read this one. It will open your eyes on many things about systems and organizations. And thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Mm -hmm. The one that you should read. Yes, read it. Uh, 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 yes. Thank you. Yeah, this one. Okay, uh, uh, I would like to thank you because I feel better now. You sent me an invoice. Okay, do you have always? Hello, uh, yeah. thank you a lot for this presentation. Uh, I was just wondering because on uh, one of your uh, slides there was a phrase invest in your creativity, yeah, but you uh, didn't tell anything on that, if I remember correctly. What did you mean actually? Here? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what I mean by it? Uh, I'm the Java developer. I was born in thinking in Java. And, I, and then I read this book and say that this is pointless. But because uh, you don't buy expensive tools, you can try to learn something new. Like I learned Python, or I learned Bash, and, li and I learned uh, graph databases just to do this old source code digging. So this is also a nice thing when you can try something new in groovy closure. So if you buy, you will have to use this tool. If you say, OK, I will search and, and try to use something that exists or, or write my own, just spend, invest your time in it. Yeah? So somebody? <coughs> Hello, thanks. Hello. Yeah, thank you. And sorry, this will be slightly off topic, but I just have, uh, ha have to ask. How do you fight with uh, upper management about doing uh, something good to your code? Because you said just fix it, yes? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm, uh, and all of us uh, are about this particular uh, mi uh, uh, mindset, but the product owners want new features. They don't want uh, fixes because uh, it takes time, so uh, they don't. They, they don't. They know. They don't uh, refill yeah. to the to the 
extent when you uh, told that uh, CEO said mm, they need uh, programmers who don't write bugs. Mm -hmm. And I, per I know one <laughs> who think that he can actually uh, fire some people and uh, and uh, get another ones mm -hmm. who will write code bugless. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you feel? Uh, how do you feel about it? And how do, how do you find? Uh, how do you fight this mindset? Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Uh, the, the one trick is to, uh, the trick wh which I use more often is to get control back for a moment. So I create options. People don't, even us, don't like, you know, do what I tell you. So create options and say, okay, if we still maintain this code, the next feature will cost you. You can be creative here, okay? <laughs> Nobody will verify it. And, uh, but if we do this, the next feature will, it's your choice, okay? Just keep the email with response in your inbox because it will be used the next time. Uh, the other thing is that uh, I'm trying to uh, play uh, from time to time uh, a bit with, uh, everybody's working on it, guys, can you fix it? So, you know, I don't, I don't have to be official. These people don't need to understand what we are doing, yeah? It's like going to the operation to doctor. It will be good, yeah? You will survive. Nobody explains you what kind of nasty things they will do with your belly. <laughs> so, you know, I sometimes uh, do a trick that I balance the team and I said, okay, you work on features and you two improve things. And from time to time, sometimes I become dramatic. Yeah, I go, guys, this is, you know, I'm leaving. <laughs> Enough. Yeah, the next line of code. This is how we extracted reporting service. I said, you know, the next time we will have to work after hours. I'm out. Yeah. So this is the problem I see. But we are not confident enough in our skills because this kind of discussions is like, oh, product owner said me. This is this is very very often in many organizations not partner to partner uh, relationship. It's the master and slave, yeah? Do it, yeah? It is the partner because they have the knowledge, the business knowledge, and we have the technicals. So it is more about you working, uh, about changing this relation, yeah? Sometimes it helps if we stop using three-letter acronyms during meetings because people feel offended, yeah? If you say, yeah, we will use SOAP and over XML on JSON using JMS, which will be fine. Don't use it. If you change the context, be intelligent, and if you talk with non-technical people, don't use these things. And they don't need, they don't really get the details, and they don't need it. Many product owners said, you know, these planning meetings are boring because you are just, you know, using these three-letter acronyms, so I get asleep, and then I don't approve because I'm bored. So change also your language. This is, this is the trick I, 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 I can tell you to do. This. Thank you. We had last person, I think, here, somebody. Yeah, here. First of all, thank for a great insight, great speech. Uh, but uh, I do wonder, uh, have you ever encountered a, a moment when technology was, uh, was limiting you, was choking your project, uh, mm -hmm. blocking your design creativity, mm -hmm. and uh, you just have to switch? How do you deal with, uh, with such, a, such a situation? You know, many times it was that the, the, the technology was not selected properly. Exactly, exactly, is, exactly. You know, it was just like, oh my God, it is not possible, you know? The hello world will look so nice, yeah? <laughs> so uh, this is the lesson I learned, but it is really worth to invest to create your own abstractions. For example, now in the system we decided to use Kafka, Apache Kafka to do messaging. And we said, and there was, you know, rumor, oh, yeah, cool, LinkedIn is using it. It is great. You can do streaming. I said, stop, 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 stop. Build abstraction. 
build our own small interfaces. Don't, be, don't build cathedrals. Stop. Yeah, it is easy to build cathedral, especially if you are, you know, wanna be architect. Build your own abstraction, which will allow you to make the decision, technical decision, at the end of the project. If you look, for example, for late recent talks by Kevin Henley and Dan North, they said, make all you can in the project, in the design, to postpone the technical decisions at the end. So you know, create your own API, small, so especially on this parts of the system you are not sure of. So this is you know, for the future. If we decide that Kafka doesn't work for us, we have our own layer, we will provide new implementation and we will switch to Rabbit and Q. So it is the, by the way you design, yeah? To make you technology independent, framework independent. So you need to do it from scratch. But when, when I just uh, hit the wall, and the uh, uh, the, the component uh, mm -hmm. that that is limiting me is is not uh, replaceable, just like that. Wrap it. This is what we did for with actuate reports. We had a part of the system in actuate reports, and we were not able to find the people to work on it, but customers were still using. So we wrapped it with, with a nice REST infer interface, and just you know, like a silo, with this yellow sign, you know, biological. In dangerous content, yeah? Don't come in. Just wrap it. And it will die slowly. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, separate. If, if, you, if you say, don't continue this path, yeah? The, the worst thing is trying to fix framework, which is not yours, yeah? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing such things. <laughs> wrap it, leave it aside. And, and sometimes it's even cheaper. It is also important how far you are in the project. It, it, sometimes it's even cheaper to throw it. Because you still have the knowledge, okay? And you will write it next time in newer framework faster, for sure. Because you won't think then about the business because you have it, yeah? Okay, thank you. Time out. Or do we have more time? Okay, cool.